Thank you. And Gary. Okay, I'm You're going right. to share. I'm going to share my screen. Yes. Let me. Thank you. Yep. And uh, and uh, hang on. There we go. Uh, thank you, Halsey. It's great to see everybody. Some I've seen you before. Um, Halsey did uh, describe a few things I've been called, but I want to um, also say that I've been called a lot of other things by my opponents, but we won't we won't talk about those tonight. Um, <laughs> And if you do this work very long, you will also get called of lots of things by your opponents. Uh, dams, reservoirs, and hydropower are false climate solutions. First few slides, I think, are going to be kind of review for us, and then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of hone in on some of the things that we have been doing specifically, and then what Joan asked me to talk about, which is our effort to get the Biden administration to not give tax credits to hydropower uh, under the Inflation Reduction Act uh, here in the United States. So, um, you you know, you a lot of you know this already, but I'll just kind of hit it briefly. Um, dams and reservoirs have a serious methane and greenhouse gas problem. Um, the original scientist who published about this was back in the 19, uh, early 1990s, Dr. Philip Fernside. Uh, he was down in Brazil. And he um, is, is one of the main people who first sort of discovered that dams and reservoirs, um, hydropower specifically down in uh, the tropics, were emitting methane uh, a little over 30 years ago. And since that time, the science has continued to escalate, um, especially by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, dozens of international uh, university research scientists, especially some here in the U.S. and also some in Canada, the IPCC and the, and the U.S. National Science Foundation. And back in 2016, 2015, we started finally to get some global media attention. Um, there was a big story that came out in the Washington Post. And so while a lot of people still haven't heard about the fact that dams and reservoirs emit methane, uh, cause the emissions of methane and greenhouse gas, the story has actually been out there for quite a bit. And the science continues to accelerate uh, on a monthly basis. Now there's over literally 750 articles in peer-reviewed science that have been written about this topic. This is a, a, um, a graph that we use in our uh, analysis tool that we work with, and it describes the emission source categories caused by dams and reservoir systems. Each one of those red boxes is an emission source, so a place where um, uh, methane or carbon dioxide is coming out of or caused by a dam and reservoir. Uh, you get a decay on exposed banks. So reservoirs go up and down when vegetation grows on the bank of a reservoir and then it gets drowned later. Um, the uh, methane is emitted because um, um, vegetation decomposes underwater. And when it does that, it's called anaerobic decomposition and it creates methane. You also get the land use change that um, there used to be different types of land use underneath the reservoir, sometimes farming that has to move away. And so you get more farming and more deforestation in other places. One of the biggest um, emission sources is from the reservoir surface. Oftentimes it's the very biggest because you get the decay of flooded organic matter in a reservoir. You also get um, organic matter flowing into a reservoir and you get photosynthesis actually in the reservoir too, which oftentimes creates algae. All of those things go into a reservoir which kind of sits there, sometimes like a stew, especially if it's warmer, uh, it starts growing algae and you'll start and you'll get um, methane emitting off the top uh, that literally bubbies, bubbles out the surface of a reservoir. And there are, um, uh, techniques and technologies that can actually measure that methane off the surface. You also get carbon sequestration loss. There used to be vegetation on the landscape, and then it gets flooded, and that is um, uh, emissions of carbon that are no longer uh, sequestering carbon. You also get emissions caused by, sometimes they can be high, of dam construction operations and decommissioning. 
Um, when we look at reservoir systems, we look at the full life cycle from the construction all the way to the, the decommissioning. And so uh, construction has, you know, all sorts of, uh, they use concrete and cement and um, fossil fuel power to create dams and reservoirs. Just like when you build anything, there's there are GHG emissions and also during decommissioning. One of the other factors is degassing de from turbines. So the same methane that exists in the water column at various different levels can also uh, come out of a turbine. And sometimes the turbine emissions can rival uh, the reservoir emissions, depending on where the turbine's at and depending on where the thermocline in the reservoir and some other technical issues. But degassing can be significant. Downstream dewatering effects are the last uh, emission source category. So when you take water out of a river or you completely change the timing of a river, it dries up wetlands downstream. And wetlands are a carbon storage system. Um, wetlands, peat, 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 uh, peat and peat bogs and those kinds of um, ecosystems store a lot of carbon. When you dry those up, they literally um, release methane to the atmosphere, which can happen over decades of period of time. So these are the uh, emission source categories that you see in a reservoir system. And um, reservoir emissions can be seen from satellites in space. There's one particular satellite up called the GHG Sat. And in 2017, they were doing a proof of concept on various types of methane emission sources, including oil and gas, including landfills. And they did one on a satellite or on a reservoir system. This is in Cameroon. This was the original photograph. And once they analyzed the photograph, this is the um, a plume of methane that is coming out of the turbine uh, on the dam here at this reservoir system. So um, it's real. This is a smoking gun, you might say. And um, you can see it on um, remote sensing satellite imagery. In 2002, things kind of broke open because for the first time in history, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, actually reported reservoir emissions to the United Nations using IPCC guidelines. And we got a few stories out of that when it happened. The United States includes dam emissions in the UN climate reporting for the first time. Um, they estimated those emissions across the United States. They only did surface emissions, but it actually finally happened. It was a big deal. And to our knowledge and to the EPA's knowledge, it was the first country in the U.S. to do that or in the world to do that, even though the IPCC had recommended that every country do it um, in 2019 when there was a uh, new revision of IPCC guidelines. So that's a big deal that the EPA is now reporting every year. They actually updated their reporting in 2023, and we saw the update when it happened. Um, they didn't really make the changes we were hoping for, but they did report again, uh, which is good news. And then we've started to get some more stories about that as it came out, including the story inside Climate News. Giant methane factories, hydropower has been long touted as clean energy, but is it? So we've been working very hard on trying to get the media to cover this story. Um, we've also had some stories uh, in the Los Angeles Times and elsewhere as we've um, had reports come out. This is one of the um, 2021, I think, major um, uh, peer-reviewed scientific article, articles. And we use this in our uh, scientific um, reporting because it estimated emissions worldwide to be about the same as from reservoirs, surface emissions reservoirs to be about the same as the heating and cooling of buildings. And of course, as we all know, the heating and cooling of buildings is something that um, most um, cities, towns, uh, even the US government, um, they address in their uh, climate mitigation models. And so uh, we're trying to just show here that reservoir emissions are um, at least in the same ballpark as some other types of emission source categories that are commonly addressed by um, climate you know, um, mitigation attempts by 
cities, states, counties here in the United States, and even the U.S. government. Um, and, you know, as a kind of final proof of, you know, proof is in the pudding, there are now multiple competing modeling frameworks to actually estimate the greenhouse gas emissions and the methane emissions caused by dams and reservoir systems. This one here called GRES is created by the hydropower industry itself. And so they actually created their own model. We don't agree with it, but they created their own model that estimates greenhouse gas emissions caused by, hydro, caused by hydropower. Um, RESME is another model, which actually was created by the Department of Energy, the US Department of Energy at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And they're also just starting to move forward that one. And then finally, a team that I work with, um, uh, and we received funding from Patagonia, created a, a whole separate modeling system called All Res, and um, we've moved forward with multiple um, applications of that tool, and uh, we're just getting ready to announce a new one, in fact, uh, in a couple of weeks about the Colorado River, Glen Canyon Dam, and Hoover Dam, which are the biggest, some of the biggest hydropower systems in the U.S., so it's not like um, everybody agrees that they create missions, including the industry, including the Department of Energy. And uh, it's just a matter of dueling modeling and dueling tools um, to uh, address, to estimate the emissions and think about what we should do about it. In that whole mix, unfortunately, still, the United States Department of Energy is still considering hundreds of new hydropower projects in the United States. And I know... This is going on across the country. Uh, it's going on in Canada. It's going on across the world. Um, some places of the world are worse than others. Eastern Europe is just a, a plethora of new projects proposed. And this is a, a map created by the Department of Energy that actually you know, looks at watersheds and then codes them. The darker green are the places where they think more emission, more hydropower can be generated. So the Department of Energy, unfortunately, is one of the worst um, uh, agencies in the U.S. government who is pushing all this forward <clears throat> included as soon as, as recently as last month, the Biden-Harris administration invested $430 million to upgrade America's hydropower infrastructure. So there's been a whole series of, um, this came out by the Department of Energy, a whole series of granting and funding that's come out of the federal government um, and this was even before the thing that I'm going to talk, talk about next, which is the Inflation Reduction Act, um, where, and if this is right off the Department of Energy's website, which you can see, Biden-Harris administration investing in American energy, support 293 projects across 33 states to improve facilities, dam safety, mitigate fish and wildlife impacts, and increase access to affordable carbon-free electricity. Now, the craziness here is that the Department of Energy itself has created their own model, estimating and proving that this is not carbon-free electricity, but you know the, the federal government has hundreds of thousands of people working for it. They're not even talking to each other in the same department. And so they're, they're pushing out information that's categorically, you know, uh, opposed to people just, you know, in the next building over or wherever um, and giving away money. Um, the very specific thing, uh, and there's not a whole lot to say about it, but I will um, get into it. Joan asked me to talk about is that, of course, in the United States, a lot of people have heard about the Inflation Reduction Act um, and some portion, which was one point two trillion dollars, I believe. About um, a third of that, I think, nearly four hundred uh, billion dollars. Uh, yeah, four hundred billion dollars was dedicated to fighting climate change in all its various forms. And um, the truth of the matter is, only about a third of that money has been given out already. And there could be a big push by the end of the year, um, depending on what happens in the election in two weeks by the Biden administration to push out, you know, billions and billions and billions of dollars. But one of the things they had to do in order to give tax credits to the hydropower industry was to make a new rule in the Internal Revenue Service, service whereby 
a hydropower company or a hydropower agency could apply for a tax credit uh, under the Internal Revenue Service. And so we engaged around that. Uh, it's a, ru a formal rulemaking process. And we put in uh, some very lengthy comments uh, to the IRS. We got, uh, I think, 17 groups to sign on to it. Um, it was led by Earth Justice, which is, of course, the law, the environmental law firm here in the United, well, they're actually international, but they used to be mostly in the United States. Uh, Patagonia, Patagonia led with it. Uh, another, my other organization, Tell the Damn Truth, including some other groups. And we got a bunch of entities to sign on to it. Um, and again, you know, they, the IRS was proposing to define hydropower as non-combustion and gasification. So as long as they weren't burning a fossil fuel, they were saying it was clean, carbon-free energy. Mm. And so we, we put in, I'll stop real quick. We put in a, there's a, one more slide. We put in a comment letter uh, in July and... There is no resolution yet. The federal government has not issued a final rule. It will probably occur before the end of the Biden administration, which will be, I think, January 3rd or 4th or something like that. So we're still waiting. I'll stop there. And I give it back to you, Halsey. I don't know how you want to handle questions at the end of the whole thing or just Thanks, now. Thanks, Gary. Ready, ready, ready. Yep. Um, we're going to take about five minutes now for questions specifically related to uh, Gary's presentation, and then we'll go on to Norman's presentation. And we will have additional time after all three uh, for more uh, comments and discussion. <clears throat> so does anybody have anything they'd like to uh, question or add or anything about? Yes, Jackie. You're muted. Yes, hello. Thank you. Um, and it's so great to see everyone. Um, <laughs> so I, I remember back in the day when we were fighting on uh, Chippy, um, I was actually part of um, the DEC air quality uh, kind of council um, ad hoc people who were trying to stop um, emissions, you know, to, to get the pipeline companies to be capturing the emissions. Mm -hmm. And when Basil Sagos finally made a ruling on it in 2021, it included, this is for New York State, it included that um, carbon had to be counted even from imported hydroelectric. And the big issue, the big issue is that they don't count because they say it's non-combustible. Um, so I'm not sure how to move that forward more than you've done, Gary and everyone, but that seems to be a very, very major issue. Um, I do remember the very first webinar that NYSERDA, the New York State um, Authority on Energy, did. It, it, it was with um, Chippy and with Clean Path. And um, I asked the question, well, what about the greenhouse gases? And there was like 20 seconds of dead silence. <laughs> and finally, Pete Rose said, oh, 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 oh we, 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 don't, we don't have greenhouse gases. Uh, or if we do, oh they disappear very quickly and then the guy from clean path jumped in and said well we don't have any like you know why would you even be thinking about having um energy from these mega dams that create all the greenhouse gases in the whole life cycle but anyway it is this big question of how can we get all of these agencies to count this that's the big question. So, so two quick um, responses, Jackie. Most agencies count two other sources of methane and even regulate them that are not combustion and gasification. One is landfills. Um, mm -hmm. A number of states, a number of cities, including the federal government, actually counts in methane emissions from landfills. And methane emits from landfills for the exact same reason. It's because you have organic material breaking down uh, right. without oxygen. So uh, when they pile everything in a landfill, there's all this organic material in a landfill. Um, it breaks down without oxygen, it creates methane. And they not only count the methane, they not only regulate it, they actually try to trap it in, right. in some right. places. Also, there's an increasing effort to 
uh, count and even regulate and sometimes also trap, although it's even harder, the methane that comes from cow belches. Right. And of course, cows aren't combusting or, um, or gasifying anything either. And so whenever they say combustion, it's got to be combustion and gasification, <laughs> you know, again, do whatever you can, but come back and say, oh, wait a second. You're also counting methane from landfills, aren't you? And you're regulating that. And they would say, well, of course we are, because everybody agrees that that's a source. And so that, that's the best thing I can say right now to that. We're fighting that fight in the state of California right now, too, which is very interesting. Um, and, but we've also you know, raised it to uh, the federal government as well. Thank you. Thank okay, you. So Cliff, Cliff, did you have a question? Yes, quick question. It looks like we're up against the wall with the Department of Energy, and, and my feeling is we probably the people in charge in the Department of Energy, or at least part of them, come from the fossil fuel industry. And it's not out of the question to consider um, really facing the fact that there's favoritism now, strong favoritism, and, and all, all the indicators point that way. And I don't know what kind of money resources we have, but we really need to start some kind of a, either a lawsuit and get some really good articles out there, how the, how the Department of Energy is favoring other industries and not doing their due diligence, what science is telling them. And the, then that exactly should be known by the public that the Department of Energy is, is basically uh, calling what strings are clean and what strings are not of energy. And that has to be made public in articles. And then we got to develop some kind of a lawsuit because that's not going to change in, until the department has pressure on it. Okay, thanks, Cliff. Certainly some food for thought in terms of action and we can take that up again um, at the end of the, of the uh, presentation. So we're going to move on now to Normand's presentation. And Normand Baudet studied environmental sciences at McGill University. He's co-founder of Montreal's Resource Center on Nonviolence and worked there as a mobilization specialist. He now works at the River... Rivers Foundation as a mobilization specialist on energy and climate issues. Through his work, Normand is in regular contact with Quebec's environmental organizations and Hydro-Quebec's workers, unions, project specialists, and decision makers. Normand will share with us issues about Hydro-Quebec, the actual political environment, under private interest influence, and the lack of a clear energy efficiency vision in the political environment of the province. Thank you for being with us tonight, Norma. Thank you for inviting me. I'm gonna share my slideshow. Just a... sharing. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. I'm gonna set it up as a slide, okay. I'm just trying to get the function of uh, having it as a slideshow mm. and Zoom is covering my my screen. So I have, a, I have a small screen. Okay. I'll show it as, okay. Oops, that doesn't work, does it? Nope. I tested it and it worked well. Mm -hmm. It's saying click it for edit. See my my zoom is covering my uh can you change uh, the view on the zoom? 
Yes, I guess. Ashley, can you share it yourself? The slideshow? Uh, let me look because yeah, I'm on a different I'm... computer than I started out with also. <laughs> yeah. so, so I now have to go to that. I had all kinds of things set up before the power went out. Yeah, all right. Uh, I'll try to share it back. Uh, how do I undo that now? Can you go through, uh, can you go into your PowerPoint um, icon? If you can go there, you you probably can share or uh, uh, not share, um, slideshow. Just a sec, I'll just close it. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Okay, the PowerPoint presentation. Sorry for that. I'm not. Oh. That... It's okay. We've all been there. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll go again. <laughs> no doubt. Okay, so what I can do is just speak about Hydro Quebec situation. Do and, that. I'm going to find find your yeah, uh, your presentation and I'll put it up. it up. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the situation right now with Hydro Quebec is that um, in the past uh, the major uh, work of Hydro Quebec was really uh, developing uh, large dams. Uh, it did start uh, in the fifties and speed it up uh, in the 60s to uh, uh, get to a point where uh, we got up to uh, 20,000 square kilometers of land flooded in Quebec uh, with uh, mega hydro dams. And uh, the Fondation Rivière uh, uh, started to be involved in the dam issue uh, with small private dams, because Hydro-Quebec, at the beginning of the 1990s, decided that, um, I, I guess, Hydro-Quebec is owned by the government, and the government decided that uh, they would use small dams uh, for regional development initiatives. And then... Uh, with those uh, small dams, they decided to distribute uh, to private enterprise contracts uh, for long-term supply of power to Hydro-Quebec. So Hydro-Quebec is the only buyer of that, uh, of that electricity. And uh, they uh, offered to promoters uh, throughout Quebec, the possibility of investing in small private dams. Small is less than 50 megawatt, uh, which is considered small. And um, then we got uh, a, a number of promoters that got very interested in having contract with Hydro-Quebec since these contracts are uh, without risk. Hydro-Quebec is uh, buying and guaranteeing the buying of the electricity for long term, and uh, the 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 logic uh, behind this is that uh, it just increases slightly uh, the the power of uh, electricity that Hydro Quebec is producing. Just to give you an example. Um, Overall, the small dams are producing 700 megawatts. Uh, the installed power of Hydro-Quebec at the moment is around 30, uh, 38,000 megawatts of production. Uh, so 
this is a situation where uh, those those small rivers are, are contributing very uh, a very small amount of of power. So what we have to keep in mind right now is that um, large dams in Quebec are very uh, unlikely to be the priority of the actual government. Uh, if they they decide to make to to build new uh, large dams, uh, those dams will be, uh, could be built in three different areas of Quebec. Uh, one area uh, which would be very expensive uh, would be mainly over the fifty fifth, uh, I guess, uh, the fifty second parallel. Which was which is way up north because most of the river uh, south of the fifty second parallel, where where most of the dams or the rivers, are already dammed, so they're already pre under production. Uh, they have a few river going down to the Bay James in the area of BTB, which is very close to Ontario. Uh, where they could build uh, new big dams. And most of the ones that are likely to be built are on the northern shore of the St. Lawrence River. Uh, we call that the area of the uh, Côte Nord, the north coast of the St. Lawrence River uh, in, uh, on Inu territory. So, so, so Hydro Quebec is unlikely to go into large dams. Uh, overall, they would have probably around twenty to twenty-two rivers that they could build dams that are to the scale that is interesting for 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 the uh, uh, Hydro Quebec's needs of production. Um, but the smaller dams is really picking up at the moment because uh, it's kind of Hydro Quebec is not that interested in building those dams, so they are they're offering it to the private enterprise, and many promoters are interested in uh, uh, joining Hydro Quebec in 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 production, so. Um, We've calculated that uh, uh, right now there's a law, a Bill 69, that is being uh, uh, going through the political process right now. And that bill is opening up uh, three fields of opportunity for private promoters. Uh, one first field of interest for them is to be partner with Hydro Quebec in uh, building large installation, but they would be mainly, as announced by Hydro Quebec, mainly uh, wind farms, but large scale wind farms that are over a thousand, uh, producing for over a thousand kilowatt, and they're planning to have. Uh, uh, something like around 10 of those large wind farm uh, produced in the in the next years to come. Um, the second opening is um, uh, Hydro Quebec is launching, evaluating the needs for production in Quebec and launching calls to offer uh, they're asking company to present projects. And in those calls for offers, um, in the past, IJO Quebec was defining the need related to its perception of the production needs or the consumption needs in Quebec. Uh, with the change within the law, uh, the tendency will be to uh, uh, accept business requests 
uh, directly. So promoters will be able to go through that process. And uh, if it's justified not for the needs of Hydro-Québec and, and Quebec's consumption, but for the need of the industry, then those projects could be allowed, which was not the case in the past. And also, there is an, an opening that private company will be able to go around that process and negotiate directly with the government the possibility of establishing new dams for industrial production. So they seem to be making a special case for uh, electricity that is to be produced uh, for the needs of the industry. And the third way is uh, that they're opening up right now is uh, industries that would just go up to the government and say, we need uh, electricity for our own production. So that would be industries that, that need a lot of electricity. And they could go up to the government and demonstrate that they have a, a very good industrial process or project and convincing the minister to authorize self-production of electricity uh, through, through uh, either dams or uh, wind farms. So, so there's, there's a strong tendency. We have to understand that Hydro-Québec is uh, following government's policy. And at the moment, we have a government that is really strong in pr promoting uh, private enterprise initiatives. And now the government is opening up for a large diversity of pressure by private enterprise to, to, to uh, uh, acquire the, the rights on either rivers or wind production. So that, that context, is creating a situation by which the major threat doesn't seem to be building up new large dams in Quebec, but the context is more into authorizing. We've evaluated that for small rivers, I was talking about larger rivers, about 20 rivers to 25 rivers that could qualify for, for large dams. At the moment, we're evaluating about 110 or 20 rivers that could be uh, uh, perceived as uh, a good source of production and, and, and a way to make uh, important revenue for private enterprise. Mm. So, um, and what makes the situation even worse is the fact that Hydro-Québec is at the moment opening up to also wind farm and the combination of wind farms which are authorized around for power around 200 megawatt to 350 megawatt and combined with a river uh, could produce a stable production which could be around 200 megawatt, which means that that industrials will be very interested in having that source of power because they could really uh, push for major industrial project uh, with that that level of power combining wind and river power. So this is a very dangerous situation because with the rules we had in the past uh, of uh, a, a top uh, 50 megawatt for small river production, um, the likelihood was to have private enterprise interested in building dams very close to consumption area because uh, all, all of the fees surrounding the connection of the dams to the network of Hydro-Québec uh, could be uh, paid for easily, uh, being close to consumption. 
while in that new environment, what we feel is that private entrepreneur uh, could be very interesting, interested in making proposal for joint production, wind farm and river uh, with a capacity of 200 megawatt and they could go and harness rivers that could be kind of quite far away from consumption area uh, out of like away from being people being affected from from those projects and they could multiply the number of rivers that could be uh, harnessed uh, this way. So this is a major concern to us. Uh, and and I, I draw Quebec in the future uh, seem to be orienting, orienting itself in uh, uh, with, with projects that will be a major wind project, like I said before, uh, a thousand megawatt projects, which could be built in area that they perceived as already disturbed by uh, mega hydro dams in the past. And in their view, it would be a compromise saying, okay, this land is already disturbed, so we'll set up windmills in this area and we're talking about industrial will windmills that are 200 meter high so more than, than 600 feet uh producing in an average uh five to seven megawatt and uh so so they would use the land that they perceived as already disturbed that that could mean the surrounding of reservoir and also on reservoir uh, that would have some kind of a shallow uh, amount of water. Um, and the, the problem we see with this is that the demand for some uh, such infrastructure uh, could be um, in the future not linked with the need of uh, the Quebec population, but uh, they could be uh, join like uh, linked uh, to the uh, uh, supply contract uh, that Hydro Quebec has signed with New York State uh, uh, electricity Massachusetts Japan, Massachusetts uh, okay. Maine right. Um, and uh, so, so, and the need for uh, uh, profit of people or uh, or of, uh, of instance that could be interested in investing in with Hydro Quebec in those projects. Mm -hmm. And in the past, uh, the problem we face is that Hydro Quebec has been so profitable. Uh, but they were able to uh, offer a very low price to the population. And this has led to uh, uh, the, 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 the corporation to be able to uh, negotiate, negotiate almost any kind of deal with private, private enterprise and being fairly confident that in the long run, they will get away with it mm -hmm. so we we have uh, uh, with hydro quebec we have a structure that is uh among population very popular because uh they've kept offering a uh, price like uh, regular user of electricity in quebec are paying around 8.5 cents a kilowatt or a kilowatt Mm -hmm. uh, of electricity i think the average in the states is something like 23 24 cents a kilowatt if i'm not if yeah. I, my memory is right yeah. so you can understand that there is a background of sympathy for almost whatever hydro quebec does mm. 
And in the in the past years, Hydro Quebec has provided the gov the government, which is the main uh, owner of Hydro Quebec, between three billion and six billion dollars uh, of revenue. Uh, depending on contracts and whatever they have in terms of opportunity uh, yes. year after year. Right. Norman. Yeah. How can you talk a little bit about your work and the work of your organization and also um, how Hydro Quebec is having to respond to uh, the government's uh, around climate change is the link being made there that uh like gary was pointing out around how dams do contribute to climate change we're far, far away from that mm -hmm. uh, i should say mm -hmm. uh the problem is that most data are collected by hydro quebec mm -hmm. even in terms of uh environmental impact Hydro Quebec has refused to do any cumulative uh, analysis mm -hmm. of the impact of uh, hydro hydro dam uh, up to now. Yeah. So uh, that created a situation by which Hydro Quebec has an enormous amount of data to defend itself mm -hmm. uh, and uh, information that is. Uh, not coming from Hydro Quebec is not very well circulated in the province at the moment, mm -hmm. okay. uh, which is a situation uh, by which you were asking about Fondation Rivière. Uh, the best we can do at the moment is at least try to stop uh, new small dams in those 120 rivers that could be targeted by private enterprise and also trying to mitigate the uh, intent of Hydro Quebec. Uh, it's, as I said, it's unlikely that large dams will be built in the near future in Quebec, but uh, we were able to convince uh, I draw Quebec's direction to be able to uh, at least start to document what are the areas that are all, already deeply disturbed by their project. Mm -hmm. We're ta talking, I was talking about 20,000 square kilometers of reservoirs, but it's 30,000 square kilometers of equipment. If you like evaluate the lines and and the uh, uh, diverse infrastructure that they need to access uh, the dams and things like that. So you're talking so, about including the the transmission lines, transmission lines, and uh, yeah. all, all other right. infrastructure that they have. So okay. it's around thirty thousand kilometers. So yeah. so they do uh, own a, a lot of very permanently disturbed mm -hmm. land. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the issues that we're able to work on at the moment is is not that much uh, the greenhouse gas issue, but really the biodiversity issue. Mm -hmm. So Good. if uh, if tactically we're able to uh, uh, really push the question of biodiversity, uh, we might be able to uh, neutralize. Uh, some of the Hydro Quebec's project uh, because uh, environmental organization have been able to demonstrate that one of the biggest environmental impact of e uh, either hydroelectric dams or wind farm is the fact that you're taking forests that are undisturbed <laughs> And you're opening up the area for uh, uh, predators, uh, which could be human predators and animal predators. Predators. Uh, pred predators, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> so 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 and, and it's one of the fact that has been striking really the people that um, the major impact that people are able to see and that is better documented than ghg yep. right is, is really the aspect of uh impact on biodiversity Okay. So at the moment, the Fondation Riviere is really looking more at this aspect than GHG, which would be kind of very hard to get data from. Mm -hmm. But if the work is picking up in the States and we're getting the information, mm -hmm. then we'll be able to figure out a way of using it mm -hmm. uh, to fight a uh, dam project for Hydro -Quebec, by Hydro-Québec. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm gonna go, end, yeah. yeah, I'm going to I'm going to give the floor to Roberta. She's put a couple things in the chat, but okay. uh, do you have a question or point that you would like to make, Roberta? Well, I just wanted to ask him those questions before we yeah. get too far. Uh, Naman, uh, Bill 69, I'm assuming, is a provincial law. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. OK, so my question or at, at least my statement, maybe, is um, how do you feel, uh, I don't know if you've been involved in the federal law that just came out a month or two ago, uh, the um, Competitions Act update uh, called Bill C-59, that's 509, okay. and whether or not you see that, or actually I'm going to have a big conversation about that uh, over next weekend with some really good lawyers uh, with the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency. But I wonder, with all these new little guys popping into the picture, is the possibility there, or would Hydro-Quebec and the Quebec government quash anything that we tried to do? Because this Bill C-59 actually allows a citizen to um, file a lawsuit on greenwashing, right? So if we have 120 rivers and let's say 40 or 50 new projects coming or new proponents coming on stream, can we possibly slow them down and even Hydro-Quebec? But we need data. Can we slow them down by saying you cannot by law state that you are not emitting greenhouse gases because you are that's the question i have and i also want one more question about gull island and whether you've heard any scuttlebutt <laughs> that's it for me <laughs> and you know why <laughs> yeah the problem with labrador is that quebec is in a, a strength position Yes, I know. Uh, you don't, Very you, well. <laughs> you, you, you don't have much choice than to go through the Hydro Quebec network yes. to get your electricity out. So negotiation is always under Hydro Quebec's uh, terms, terms and strength. Mm -hmm. Or, or we yeah. could go and build another Muskrat Falls and a. Labrador Island Link for thirteen billion dollars. Yeah, right. <laughs> and Hydro Quebec knows that. Yes, exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. What was the other question? Oh, yeah. The, the, the other the, question yeah. was about about uh, Bill C fifty yeah. nine, which is the new um, upgrade to the Competitions Act, and whether or not you think, because to me, I belong to this caucus where I'm going to the meeting next week, and it's an environmental assessment caucus. Yeah. To me, I hope I find out that I'm right or close to right. Bill C-59 is actually a stronger law in Canada than the silly Impact Assessment Act, which to me is nothing but a farce. Okay. Um... The, the the way the way I would use that aspect of uh, of green uh, washing mm -hmm. with Hydro Quebec uh, 
the case that could be made is the fact that electricity is so cheap in Quebec mm -hmm. that there's no incentive to be energy efficient mm -hmm. to implement any uh, energy economy uh, equipment infrastructure. For example, in the States and in Canada, we're talking a lot about local grids mm -hmm. and efficient and and smart local grids in quebec this is a non-issue like we right. don't hear about it we don't uh, they, there's nothing being done so hydro quebec at at the moment has no interest in invent investing in any ways in energy efficiency or uh, consumption reduction or whatever so th this is to me the most powerful uh, powerful level leverage that we have in terms of greenwashing for hydro quebec saying that hydro quebec as a structure of wasting energy i'm not sure that the competitions act covers that because i've only read parts of it but okay. certainly do you have you any knowledge of the a section of the act? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> I've been involved in Bill, Bill 69 up to now. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah. and, and I, I'm and immersed it's, it's, in Bill 15, C59, but, but so far I've just been reading the sections that just got upgraded. But I, I uh, understand that there are, uh, I mean, let's face it, Hydro-Quebec has no competition. Right. No. So, so how can you possibly use a competitions act against yeah. Hydro Quebec? That's I a mean, good point, Roberta. Less. Yeah, huh? that's a good point. Yep. Yeah. I'm going right. to move on now to uh, yep. Cliff, who also had a question or a comment. Because we Norman, need more. Norman. Yeah. I appreciate all your hard work and frustration. A question <laughs> for you: Do you see Hydro Quebec? HQ as being able to get around and circumvent Canadian law to do pretty much whatever they want. Good question. Um, they don't need, I, I, my answer would be they don't need to. But, what they're doing at the moment is enough so, to, sustain, so, to sustain themselves very well and generate the revenues and ger generate the profits. So, so they don't need to to go around federal Canadian federal federal laws. But if they need to, it doesn't. You're you're making it sound as if they they're doing whatever they want in disturbed land and going to try to ruin another 120 rivers and pretty much i know quebec is not interested in those 120 rivers the problem the pressure will come from private entrepreneurs and and they will negotiate directly with the government not really looking at uh, as I said at the beginning, 700 megawatt of private production in small river is just nothing for Hydro Quebec. It's of no interest to them. So they, what they did is that they negotiated the fact of letting that go to private enterprise, and uh, negotiated with the government to be in charge of large. Uh, wind uh, wind uh, plants uh, wind fields uh, on on their installation and the government said yeah the government said yes so hydro quebecs uh, will not be involved to me in my view that much in most of the the the, the next river damming mm -hmm. projects mm -hmm. It's unlikely that they will be very much involved. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Normal.
And um, hopefully we'll have some more time in the discussion at the end. We're going to turn now to our third speaker, Becky Bartovix. Becky's a farmer on North Haven Island off the coast of Maine. And she's also a member of the executive committee of the Sierra Club, the Maine chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, she spent her career in water and energy conservation as well as journalism. Since 1975, she's been involved in examination of alternative energy and energy conservation. Since 2005, she's been uh, on the executive board of the Maine Sierra Club, as I mentioned, and also on a national Sierra Club team. And she says, what drives me most particularly are issues that relate to clean water and the means for humans to reduce our footprint on the planet. She's been involved with Sierra Club Maine's effort to hold Maine and Hydro-Quebec slash Iberdrola accountable for the environmental damage they propose to do to Maine's, Maine's waters and lands through the NECEC project, which is proceeding. That's that, that's that new line that's being built through Maine to bring more of Hydro-Quebec's energy into New England uh, through a transfer station in Lewiston, Maine. Um, with no real direct benefits to Maine itself. Um, she says, I've worked to address the damage that Hydro-Quebec and the Canadian government does in using mega dams to prop up their economy while ignoring the huge social and ecological damage their projects are causing. So with that, Becky, I turn it over to you. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you, and thank you to Gary and, and also to Normand for uh, what you have already spoken about. Um, it's uh, very interesting, fascinating. Um, I prepared some talks, so, but I think I'm going to go off my preparation. Um, but I will, I don't know if this is going to work because I did not set up slides, but I think uh, for one second, if you can let me share my screen, we'll see if this shows up. Is it? All right, can you do that for me, Halsey? You can share your screen, Becky. Oh, I can. Okay, yes. let me see if this will work because I'm I'm just using the Hydro Quebec Plan 35. So now, how do I do that and have the same thing? Okay, one second. <laughs> uh, we'll see if this works. If it doesn't, I'm gonna I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Okay. Nope. Okay, never mind. It's not gonna do it. Okay, so you can't um, share your screen. Nope. So uh, it's not it's not going to show what I want. So how do I get out of it? X. It now I don't want to. Uh, OK, I don't want to. Ugh. All right. It's going to just sit there forever. Um, so I was going to show the um, 20, 2035 plan by um, Hydro Quebec, which uh, talks about um, the the various sectors that they would like to increase their energy production by, um, including hydropower, which is 38,000 to 40, this is the largest, it's like 45% of the total increase in energy uh, production that they plan to make, which is a total of 8,000 to 9,000 9, more megawatts of electricity. They talk about energy savings um, as 1,600, they solar, they're only looking at five to 1,000, 500 to 1,000, wind power 15,000, 1,500 to 1,700. But hydropower is the absolutely largest sector that they talk about, 3,800 to 4,200 uh, 4, um, megawatts. So it's unlikely, but. Yes. Right. So I'm hearing you and thinking, well, you know, Hydro Quebec never has actually told the truth to the United States. So um, and so I would and I would have been our principal um, liaison with our lawsuit against the Army Corps of Engineers and um, the Department of Energy on the NECAC project. Um, and in that project, they um, first of all, I don't know how this happened, but they sold the power to the United States. They sold the power to um, the ISO New England through the Massachusetts RFP. And I'm gonna have to turn the light back on. Um, and for some reason, the room I'm in keeps going dark. Okay, I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, um, energy savings uh, here at College of the Atlantic. Um, and um, so, 
so they were able to sell it without any cost basis. And so the, and, but they did sell power that was supposed to be already generated power. They were yeah. not to be increasing any other source of power in order to provide this power to the United States. Um, which do you know, ISO first, New England? To ISO New England, yes, through right. through the NECAC project. That was part of the that was part of the RFP. It was part of this the 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 uh, permitting that was required. Um, but there was really no one who was holding due diligence to them. And so, frankly. What they are going to be doing is funding Canadian power by selling peak power to the United States is what it looks like to me. And and so I think I, I don't know how I mean, Gary probably can help us with this thing. But if they're looking at, you know, actually letting, you know, um, private equity firms develop rivers in Canada in order to sell peak power to the United States. We have to really work pretty hard to prevent that from being the model that they use. Um, because, you know, I, and that's what it looks like to me. Because Vermont, 75% of Vermont's power comes from Hydro-Quebec. You know, Chippy, I don't know, I, I, I forget where Chippy is exactly right now, whether it has been approved or not, but that's the, you know, um, Champlain, um, under the Lake Champlain. And then, of course, we're in the process of, you know, getting this power uh, delivered through, um, through, through the transmission line that was voted against by the people of the state of Maine, but somehow... Um, it happened anyway because we have some miraculous new court called the Main Business Court that denied the um, the citizens' initiative. So, um, so it's it, it we we are up against some pretty heavy players in tr in terms of trying to protect the rivers. And I mean, all of us on this call apparently understand the damage that is happening, you know, to the Arctic waters, to the Labrador current, to, you know, the Greenland shelf, to um, the, the St. Lawrence River. Um, and uh, if I'm leaving anybody out who doesn't know about that, uh, please wave your hands because that's what a certain amount of what I was going to talk about. But, um, you know, the my, my son's a lobsterman um, and, you know, the, the diatoms, in the rivers, I mean, in the water, come down into the the bays and feed everything that that then results in a fishery that is you know that is viable. And we have one percent of the fisheries that you know there were historically because of these dams, largely because of these dams because of lack of fish pa fish passage. Um, I was just reading the main um, Indian state. Uh, main tribal state commission statements about you know stopping water and what that has done to sustenance for the main tribal um, communities and um, and you know honestly it, it, it's almost an intentional colonization effort to you know to subjugate those people and anybody who is a sustenance sustenance survivor um, and, and that's what those reservoirs have done as well but I'm I'm just trying to think you know if you're saying um, and I don't know if this you know I don't know because we're you know looking at these dams that they had originally projected at the time that they promised there was going to be no new power to us in the statement of I mean it wouldn't have taken a whole lot of research since I could find it um, that Hydro Quebec's plan was to add 16 new mega dams at the time in the in 2018 uh, 2018 when they were you know up making the applications so you know it, if they have altered that to allowing private dam construction to do a lot of that extra energy for the United States that's another um, layer that we we have to address. Windmill, so, windmill will be the main source. But they're only saying projecting, uh, you know, 1,500 to 1,700, uh, I think that's what it says here, 1,500 to 1,700 um, new uh, megawatts of power that they're talking about. This is already outdated. Uh, okay, this is their 2035 <laughs> plan. It's, okay. it's, it's moving very quick right now, okay. the energy policy in Quebec. Okay, well, that, so... That, that is outdated. All right. Well, that so so. Um, I don't know how we address that really here in the United States, but we're clearly connected 
um, in terms of, well, we already are, always are connected by water in every way. And there's, you know, but in fact, um, we are clearly connected in our policies and how we can, you know, work together with you so that we can, you know, address some of these issues with those people who are selling us energy in the United States. And so um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm saying that I'm not, I'm not adding a whole lot to the discussion here, um, except to say that I have yet to see CMP tell the truth. And um, Iberdrola was just able to buy out all of the Vanguard. And so now it's Iberdrola, which is a huge international corporation, which is providing us our electricity. Um, we had a major effort um, to try to stop the either, um, well, to stop the uh, our power, our utilities in Maine from being um, the, the um investor-owned utilities, and that would be Iberdrola. We were trying to, to have the main be provided energy by consumer-owned utility. And that then we would be much more in charge of, of how, we, how we were getting the power. But since that failed, um, you know, it's it we're, you know, we have to go to plan B, which hasn't fully been developed yet. Um, and so I'm wondering what you're, um, I'm actually going to throw questions back at both you and Gary. How, how can we move forward in this international relationship between Canada and the United States where it appears that much of our, you know, northern tier uh, states seem to be, if they're at all concerned about greenhouse gas emissions, seem to think that, you know, Hydro-Quebec is providing something that is clean and green. So, um, where where are we going to go with Canada? Where are we going to go with the United States? Okay, Jackie. So should I answer? <laughs> well, I mean, I said, I mean, I I feel like you 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 have provided information that I didn't know, and so I'm I I was going okay. by basing myself on on some apparently antiquated information. I can give more information about the main tribal council and others, but um, I, I'd rather have this discussion, you know, really move us forward in terms of directions that we can go to um, address the cross border okay. issues. Yep. I was you, thinking, you, Gary, you just, just one minute, Jackie. Norman, did you want to respond to that? Yeah. Uh, as I said earlier, um, the main problem we face in Quebec is the fact that electricity is so cheap that we are wasting a lot of energy and there's no serious structural program for energy efficiency or energy consumption reduction. And, and to me, this is a key element uh, uh, because... Uh, Hydro Quebec's production, uh, like increasing Hydro Quebec's production, to me at the moment is stupid. Yeah. Like any increase in Hydro Quebec's production is a, a completely stupid choice. Well, of course it is, but it it isn't if we are buying it all and we're buying it at three times what you are paying for it they're funding and that's that's the that's one of the serious problems is that they you know they somehow negotiated a contract with the, with ISO New England without any kind of cap on the cost to the ratepayers and so it's it's a shocking mm. to me that they were willing to negotiate it that way and 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 why it wasn't stopped and part of why we're still in a lawsuit with the department of energy when I mean, we still have a pending lawsuit which has not been you know completed although we are going to lose mm. um we are hoping that we have a settlement of some kind which should include and i haven't mentioned this but one of the permitting um, one of the requirements that per, that they were, per, you know, allowed them to get a permit um, was that they would have to put um, put aside fifty thousand acres or forty seven thousand acres of similar, you know, uh, wetlands and, and habitat um, in Maine, and they have not found it. They haven't looked very hard. I don't think nobody's just handing it out to them for free. And so consequently, they have um, tried to approach the Department of Environmental Protection here in Maine to reduce the, um, to change the permit. Um, but the, luckily the department, <laughs> sorry, oh my God. 
<laughs> Luckily, the Department of of Dep Department of Environmental Protection has told them that they would have to reapply for their permits mm -hmm. if they go for an in lieu fee program, which means putting money aside mm -hmm. in anticipation of some mis you know mythological land that's the same as the fifty five miles of that they destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's some other mythology that happened, um, you know, because they also in their permit were required. Um, they so they have a th 150 wide foot wide and we're not talking meters here so unfortunately i can't really do that but it's not that different um 150 feet wide corridor but they have a 300 foot uh, right of way um that comes you know from canada to um to the middle of the state of maine um and they were supposed to taper the trees that was part of the permit but that is irrational and another mythological nightmare because of course there is no machine that they have that would be driving along cutting trees at varying heights from the middle, like a little curved circle of trees. So that, you know, that is another whole thing that was allowed. And when, you know, we addressed the Army Corps of Engineers at the time and said how they were asked how they were um, going to um, enforce the laws or the permits. Um, they told us that they had haphazard enforcement at best. So, uh, you know, basically they've got a green light to do whatever they want. And, you know, they created a new court so that they could, you know, actually obviate the, the citizens initiative. So it, it, I, I think we're in pretty tough shape on the other hand, it seems like what we have to do is stop these small scale, any large, any number of these small scale rivers being closed because they're so important to the downstream environment. Yeah. And and so anyway, that's that's what I think. Thanks, Becky. Okay, I'm going to turn now to Jackie, who's had her hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, here in New York State, we've been totally greenwashed everyone has been greenwashed by hydro quebec um and the champlain hudson power express i just wanted to give you an update um first of all like maine the deal the contract stated that there were to be no new dams for power for new york okay so maybe they're not going to be building new dams for power for new york the whole idea of it was to bring energy into the new york city area um to cut down on the peaker plants usage the gas you know, um, fossil fuel peak plants. Um, but they're not, Hydro Quebec does not have to supply wintertime energy and they can take back the energy. They can buy it back. Um, and that means these peaker plants are most likely going to be able to come into action. Um, also, it's costing $6 billion to the ratepayers of New York. And two commissioners on the PSC were totally opposed to this. They actually resigned, not necessarily because of this, but the two commissioners who were 100% opposed to this um, resigned. And I will tell you that one of the things that you guys don't know is that Rory Christian, who is the new chair of the Public Service Commission in New York, um, during the vote on this, um, it was a vote for Clean Path and Chippy together and one of the commissioners, the different one asked, well, can these be voted on separately because they're two different projects? And Rory Christian said, yes. And then when it came time to the vote, they bundled it together and the people did not have a choice to vote on them separately. So I just feel there's so much illegal stuff that's gone on here. It's just incredible. And from my neck of the woods, Rockland County, and I remember being on the first NAMRA webinar about Chippy and the devastation that was going to happen in New York State. And boy, is it happening. And it's happening on land and it's happening on the waterways in the Hudson River. It, you know, it's it's just it's just a disaster here. It's an absolute disaster all up and down New York State. I know people whose farms have been totally destroyed, totally destroyed. Um, the eminent domain has been horrific. Mm -hmm. So. It makes me just feel terrible. Thank but you, thank you so much for this um, this webinar and this this whole yep. situation. Thank We're you. We're going to continue it. I'm going to go next to Wilden and then Annie and then Cliff. 
Talking with Richard Kaufman, who's the energy czar of New York State, we we got this one line from him about the balance of payments. New York buys so, let me see, Canada buys so much from New York, but we don't buy anything from, so we have to have some way to balance payments. Has anybody else bumped into this one and understood that we don't sell things to Canada, we only, that they sell so much to us, the balance of payment business? I have not heard that. And that was in a Sierra me. Club uh, meeting with Richard Kaufman and Annie. She's up next. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, 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 hi, bonjour. Bonjour. Um, bonjour. <laughs> un, jour, un jour, je vais vous appeler. Alors, ce que je voulais dire, c'est que she, what I want to say is that in New York, and what Quebec doesn't understand and Roy Dupuis doesn't understand is that there hasn't been a strong campaign by the, the Quebecois or by the First Nations since the James Bay, Aqua, Great Whale campaigns to inform people here of the consequences of dams. And the mythology here has been that they're not building any new dams. It's surplus. We got to buy it. But ever since the cancellation of contracts in the early 90s, Hydro Quebec just goes and builds and then sells. It's not any type of construction that is tied to a new contract. And so they've been developing these projects and claim a surplus. Now, there's not a surplus in Quebec. And I'm not seeing anything within the movement or within the examination of the contracts with New York, for example, that could challenge the existing contracts based on the scarcity of power in Quebec, and that maybe there could be a legal team looking at these contracts because the way the New York contract is written, there are loopholes within it that could cause for cancellation. So my question would be, what's your sentiment about exploring the possibility of revoking or canceling these contracts, specifically in New York. Okay. Um, there is a kind of mythology related to electricity situation in Quebec. I'm going to explain myself. Yes, since the last... I would say 20 years, the information that Quebecers got from Hydro-Quebec was that we were facing enormous surplus, surpluses, uh, surpluses that we didn't know what to do with. And uh, it was presented as uh, money that was just flushed away uh, through the dams because there was no use for it, but we had, we had the dam and at some point we had to empty the dams uh, so we could uh, accommodate more, more, more water. Uh, the change that happened in the last three years is a new... Uh, it gives us a quite new perspective. Uh, a government came into power six years ago that decided to sign contracts with American states, uh, I, I would say eight years ago, uh, and major contracts for long term. Uh, they decided to uh, subsidize the cheapest electricity in the world, uh, the, the, uh, the, the big consumer of electricity, the large enterprise that are using a lot of electricity are paying for the, uh, five, uh, 5.4 uh, cents a kilowatt, a kilowatt. And they've, they've been subsidized to a level of paying 4.2 cents a kilowatt mm. uh, so they they generated an enormous demand uh, uh like 
if if you want to fulfill that demand, you would have to double Hydro Quebec's size uh, to be able to do it within the next ten years, which is completely unrealistic. Uh, and so 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 th that uh, supposedly scarcity of energy is uh, uh, is some kind of faked by uh, 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 an unrealistic demand crea creating created uh, on the world market for major uh, consumer of electricity. The reason why they did that is that politically they wanted to start back and convince the population of Quebec that we needed to start back construct construction of dams, but not really like in the intent. Like we were listening at the two thousand thirty-five uh, uh, plan of, of Hydro Quebec. In that period of time, the vision was uh, we will put forward any kind of project. They could have been large dams, uh, small dam, dams, uh, or wind power. It didn't matter. They, they wanted to increase quickly the production. But there was, in the last months, there was a major opposition to many elements and and they know that the the physical possibility of building new large dams uh, the 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 potential is very it is very unlikely that people will accept that so in the last i would say since last spring uh hydro quebec's position and the government's position which is Kind of adjust, uh, adjusted constantly, uh, continuously. Um, uh, they adjusted the the, the perception uh, towards what I said, which is which is switching from any kind of large dams to uh, wind production. So. Uh, uh, may, may I just put in yeah. another point here, and yeah. I'm I'm sorry to cut in, but no, no. Yes. There's been a an absolutely embarrassing campaign in New York by Hydro Quebec and their representatives, okay. with Serge Aberiel yeah. and Peter Rose, absolutely, uh, with um, Grand Chief Sky Deer of uh, uh, Kanawagi, and um, their divisions of the environmental justice community, tactfully with a corrupt board member of Sierra Club National, Aaron Mayer, coming in to stir up and divide the communities in New York City, deliberately. And they were extremely strategic. I wonder who their team is, but it's an absolute embarrassment to, to um, know. And there has not been any disclosure of these activities of Hydro-Quebec and the way they falsely promote their campaigns aggressively down here in the city. Just what did they know. say? Yes. They are, they came to Queens, they divide a low income community, they claim that they're going to be cleaning the air with this, this clean energy and reducing asthma and paying the laundry for kids and bringing them up to Adirondack Park and misrepresenting the impacts of hydro, not explaining the facts, claiming this to replace nuclear actually. They lie and lie. I've met these individuals. They are absolutely deceptive. And it's a shame that they would need to use those tactics to get uh, some kind of handle on the public relations right. for their campaign here in New York. And that's all I'll say. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. I'm going to turn now. Uh, just one moment, Cliff. I want to go back to a, a point that uh, Roberta raised, um, Norman. And so she's asking... She says we need data on the actual lack of conservation in Quebec and how much usage could be saved if Hydro Quebec actually had a policy on conservation. Do you know? Is there any data? Do you have anything on that? Uh, I will have to look for that, but yes, I could send you, Ashley, some information. Great on this. Yeah. 
Super. Okay. Uh, we're we're working on this at the moment with a, a network of uh, Quebec's environmental organization. Excellent. Okay. And and if you could share it with us, that would be super. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Go ahead, Cliff. I will. Well, I hear a, a lot of frustration happening right now, and uh, without legal representation or legal standing we're going to bang our heads against the wall we got to realize that we're working against multi-billion millionaire organizations that have endless amounts of money and endless amounts of power both in in across the border and here in the u.s i can go through annie's complaints i can go through becky's complaints these complaints are not going to end. We have to find some way of connecting the climate crisis, the ecological crisis. At what cost do we want to have cheap energy? At the cost of a living planet? That's something you shouldn't forget, Norman. And we have proof. We've got to get scientists and people with money on board to go against these corporate people who do not care about a living planet or an ecological system that's healthy. We're going to keep banging our heads against the wall. I will just give you a brief background. I, right now, I'm doing a lot of media work. I'm contacting organizations. We're writing, writing articles online. That's my effort and my job in NECAP. Some of you I sent, sent out Stephen Kasperzak's books. I just sent a book out to a, a scientist and an educator in Trento, Italy. I uh, sent it airmail, two books, and he's going to have some of his postgraduate students do uh, theses on the water vapor and all the GHGs associated with large dams. So my point is, is that we have two options. One is we have to find legal representation who's going to sue these people left and right when they try to break the laws. And two, we have to get the word out for as many people as we can that we're looking to have a living planet and, elect and, a, a, and an ecological system that's healthy to support a living planet. We can't keep banging our heads against the wall. We gotta keep you know, pushing information. Yeah, Cliff, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, I think you're preaching to the choir here, Cliff. Well, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but we okay. gotta stop all Our right. frustration is so, going to yeah. get us anywhere. That's true. Okay, so we we are a little over our time, so to speak. I just want to ask um, if Gary has any final comments he would like to make. Uh, you've been, yeah. Thanks, Gary. No, no final comments. I'm happy to uh, have been on the call. Appreciate everybody. Um, Thanks. it's, it's a, it's, you're pushing a rock up a hill and yeah. the further we push it, the bigger it gets, it seems mm -hmm. like. And so, um, everyone's frustrated and, uh, it's totally justified for the frustration mm -hmm. and you just wake up every day and do what you can, which is all I can do. Thank you, Gary. Thank yeah. you, Normom. And thanks to Becky. You had to leave oh. early, uh, for this. Our next webinar is on Wednesday, uh, November 21st. Is that a Wednesday? I'm going to have to look. It's on November 21st, same time. And we're going to have the, the primary presentation then is going to be Roger Wheeler, who's part of our NICAPA group, who works directly with Stephen Kasperzak. And he's going to do a presentation on how mega dams create unchecked heat pollution and contribute to climate change. So a little more detail uh, from Stephen Kasperzak's work following up on what we, we saw from Gary uh, today. I think we have a lot more to do and I'm hoping that we will continue um, having monthly meetings with this group and more um, after the webinar series is over. So looking at the beginning of next year, I think you can expect to see you know, an invitation for a monthly uh, speaker presentation and discussion. Thank you all. Uh, great to see you, and Thank I look you. forward to working with you all again in the future.